to part seven of our study, going through the great book of what? Revelation. And I'm excited about this book. You know, when you study the Bible, you can be excited about the Bible, about Revelation, especially really all the books. I don't know if there's any one better than any other, but I thank God for all 66 of them. Aren't you thankful for that? They're really all one book. And uh, uh, it's, it's the Word of God, the Bible, the Word of God. And Jesus is the Word of God. When you put the Bible in your mind, you're putting God is entering you. The Holy Spirit uh, is entering your mind and heart as we study the Word of God. Isn't that thrilling? We're going to see Jesus very soon. And I'm glad we can study this to help us prepare for that. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And we're starting here in this wonderful study. We're going to find some interesting things today, things that you probably didn't think that you're going to study. We're going to study. So I'm starting Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Here we go. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art what? Dead. We don't want a name that we claim to live but being dead. We don't want that, do we? We'd be hypocrites, wouldn't we? But Jesus says, I know thy works. When Jesus tells you the way you are, can you say, no, I'm sorry, you're wrong, I'm not like that. Can you say that? No, because Jesus knows. Uh, now, verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Uh, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If, therefore, thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now he gives them a, uh, a commendation, verse 4. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That's a wonderful message to the church of Sardis. Now, what time period did the Sardis church begin and end? Now, as we know, I've mentioned before, these messages to the seven churches are to the literal churches in Asia of those people that were living there, but they're all dead now. So this message has to mean more than just to them or else it's not worth anything. But it was a message to them and this truly described them. But it has a wider application to the seven church periods from <coughs> 31 AD to 100. That was the first church. 100 to about 3, some say 323, some say 331, the second church period, which we've covered. Then 331 to 538 was the third church period. Then 538 to 1798, that was Thyatira, that was the church period that the papacy was ruling the earth. And... Uh, uh, what was the name, secular name or uh, name of the uh, Christian church from 538 to 1798? What was the name of it? Thyatira. Yes, that's a biblical name, but what's the name that they all knew it by? It was the Roman Catholic Church. Now, can you think of any other name of any other church, Christian church in the world at that time that existed at that time? The answer is no. There was no other established, or I should say official, church 
during uh, that period, 530, 1798, except the Roman Catholic Church, that's all there was. Except a few heretics, <laughs> with the Pope, uh, uh, he said, you, your tails are all tied together in the same knot. Now they were, were they members of the Roman Catholic Church? Yes, they were. Many of them were. Some of them had gotten kicked out. But the Pope was very irritated with them, and there were, they had different names. They didn't all have the same name. There was the Albigenses. There was the Waldenses. There was the Huguenots. There were the Lollards. There was a number of different ones. Uh, these are the main ones I've mentioned. But the Pope saw that they had a lot in common. What did they have in common? Jesus and the Word of God. They all had different names, all these sects, all these cults, all these crazy people, but they had Jesus and the Word of God in common, and the Pope uh, was very frustrated. They tried to murder them and wipe them out for many years, hundreds of years. They couldn't seem to get rid of them all. They did massacre many millions of them, but the Pope said he revealed that they all had something in common, though they had different names and they were located in different places. You, the, he, the Pope said, all, you, your tails are all tied together in the same knot. That was a great compliment from the Pope, wasn't it? Great compliment. So the only church in the world that anyone knew much about was the Roman Catholic Church. But there was another church that God knew something about, it was the church that had all their tails tied together in the same knot. It was the church that had different names on the earth, but it was the church that Hebrews chapter 12 reveals that was written where? In heaven. Now that's a lesson that the Roman Catholics were very slow to learn, but that lesson will be repeated in our day, and most people still won't learn it, they'll still try to kill those people that are tied together in the same knot because those people are still alive, aren't they? Not the original people, but the same kind of people that have different names but are tied together with the same knot. And the Rome still doesn't like those people. In fact, um, I just learned that there was a big meeting in the Vatican in Rome this past May, and I learned that there were representatives of different uh, Protestant denominations that went to the Vatican to meet the Pope. And I read this in a Roman Catholic publication, and I read in this Roman Catholic publication that a representative from the Seventh-day Adventist Church was among them. And I learned, now I've never told anybody this yet, but I learned uh, from a Seventh-day Adventist minister who told his church member, and they called my office, I learned what went on a little bit at that meeting, and I learned, in fact, there were three, as far as I understand, three Seventh-day Adventist officials there at the Vatican, along with the other uh, Protestant officials, and I learned through this brother who talked to his pastor that Rome, the officials of Rome expressed, expressed displeasure about Seventh-day Adventists and the Sabbath. But I learned that those officials from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, from the General Conference, to the officials of Rome, they upheld God's Sabbath. And I thank God for that. Then I learned something else. I learned that the Vatican official was complaining to the Seventh-day Adventist officials about Seventh-day Adventists converting a number of Roman Catholics to become Seventh-day Adventists. Rome doesn't like that. Rome doesn't like the people of the church to leave the church and join cults and sects who have their tails tied together in the same knot. The church officials don't like that. And so they complained to, and in fact, the Vatican officials don't even call the Protestants churches. They call them uh, some other name. Communi communi communities. They won't even call them churches because the Catholic Church is the only church. They call these others communities, or in other places they call them sects, or uh, mainly sects, or communities, offshoots. 
uh, heretics, whatever they want to call it. And so they had these people come to this church meeting to try to help shape their minds to be more in harmony with the real church. So they complained to the Seventh-day Adventist community men uh, about some of these community sects converting Roman Catholic real church members to join their sects. And I learned that this pastor said the Seventh-day Adventist men upheld and they said people have a free choice and we cannot do away with their free choice. And in those words, they were upholding the actions of Seventh-day Adventists, daring to convert Roman Catholics out of the real universal church into one of these sects, which God recognizes, even though uh, Rome or the world doesn't recognize. But I'd rather be recognized by God, wouldn't you? Isn't that the main way to be placed to be recognized in heaven? Because the time is coming, Sister White says, that, <clears throat> that the real, God's real people will be little known to the Catholics. They'll know that they exist, but other than that, they won't know much about them at all, except that there's some weird sects that are not acting in the official accepted way. I thought that would be interesting to you. Wasn't it interesting that I told you that? I thank God that these Seventh Adventist men upheld the Sabbath and they upheld the freedom to, of God's people to, to convert dear Roman Catholics to the truth of God. Amen. Now, um, here, uh, to the Church of Sardis, Jesus is saying, I know your works, you've got a name, but you're really dead. Now, this church, church period of Sardis, when did that exist? We know it was 1798, that's when Thyatira ended. 1798, this one began, Sardis began, and how long did it last? It went to about 1843. Uh, short time, 1798 to 1843, was only about 45 years. Then the next church, Philadelphia, was 1843 to, to when? Well, it was it wasn't it wasn't long. It was just a very short period until Laodicea began. What I learned at school was from 1843 to 1844. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Uh, and it, after the Great Disappointment, 1844, uh, the the people there after the disappointment, they just kind of you know just. Well, it's all over, and Laodicea started taking over. We have the truth. We're rich and increased with goods. We've got the truth. We have need of nothing. One of my the, the conference treasurers was talking to us in a in a workers' meeting, and the conference treasurer he was getting up, and of course his work was to deal with the money part. So he said, "You know, Seventh Day Adventist ministers used to be poor, and I know that's right. My grandfather was a Seventh Day Adventist minister." And they were so poor that my mother had to get her clothes out of the Dorcas barrel. They used to have a barrel, and they put clothes down in this barrel. And my mother, the daughter of the Adventist minister, had to get her own clothes out of that barrel and go out on the street and sell uh, popcorn or something to get a little money to, to do things. And they were poor. And so the treasurer knew that. And so the treasurer said, you know, Adventist ministers used to be poor. But he said, now we're rich. <laughs> and he stopped there. And I started to, I was tempted to finish the verse. <laughs> and, say, and increased with goods and had need of nothing. But I didn't do that. I held back. Uh, but was it true? <clears throat> yes. But that's not our subject today. We're talking about Sardis now. But when we get to Laodicea, who is that describing? Is that describing you and me? Yes. So we need to pray, oh God, save me from myself. Help me, Lord. That's what Peter should have prayed. Remember Peter. He said, Lord, I'll never deny you. I'll never forsake you. I'll die with you. And so uh, uh, he knew that he would, he would be faithful to Jesus. And so well, a few hours later, what was he doing? He was cursing and swearing that he never knew it. Just a few hours later. Wasn't that interesting? Here's a question. Are you stronger than Peter? 
If you say, oh yes, I'm stronger than Peter. I'll never deny the Lord. I'll never go along with the National Sunday Law. That proves that you're just like Peter, and you will. Uh, Peter's only hope, the prophet said, he, would ha he had one hope. His only hope would be if he prayed. When Jesus told him, you're going to deny me before the cock crowed twice, you'll deny three times this very night that you never knew me. He had one hope. If he said, Lord, please save me from myself. Please save me from myself. He would have been saved. But he didn't pray that, did he? He was kind of like us. He knew he was rich, spiritually rich, and increased with goods and had need of nothing. I'll never deny you. And so that's just what he was doing just a few hours later. You might think, I'll never go along with the National Sunday Law. I'm strong. I've been in the church for 40 years. There's no way in the world. I know all about it. I know those who go along with that will have the mark of the beast. They'll be in the lake of fire. There's no way I'm going to do that. But that's just what Peter said, wasn't it? Our only hope is every day if we pray, Lord, please save me from myself. I don't know myself. I don't. Only you can save me, Lord. I'm not good. I'm not good. I'm weak and helpless. And unless you save me, I'll be lost. I claim Jesus. Dear Father, save me from myself. Friend, if you'll pray like that every day, he will save you. <coughs> he will save you. Thank God. Isn't that wonderful we have that hope? And we don't have to be like Peter. Are most Seventh Adventists around the whole world going to soon be Sunday keepers? Yes. How many? Over five million? Will five million do it? Over more than five million? What's the answer? Yes. Sure. Yes. How do you know it's over five million? It's over half. Because sure. the prophet said the majority will forsake us. And how many Adventists are there in the world now? Thirteen. Thirteen. Million. The last I heard it was eleven. That's long count. What is it? 13, 13. Okay, 13 million. Then it's more than 6 million are soon going to be Sunday keepers. I wouldn't dare guess how many. I, I'm tempted, but I won't dare guess. But I know that it's over 6 million of them around the whole world. And the church is growing now. Over 1,000 people every day are becoming Seventh-day Adventists, not realizing that soon they're going to be Sunday keepers. That's why uh, the devil likes to bring lots of people into the church. Did you know that? People that are not really what? converted. One time in a workers meeting, there was a uh, Bible worker up there, a very uh, well-known man who wrote a book, a manual on how to get Bible studies and how to win souls. He was a very godly man in this workers meeting and he was talking about how to get Bible studies and how to win souls. In fact, tomorrow evening we're going to begin our 29th soul winning school. And so we need to be talking about how to get Bible studies and how to win souls. And that's what he was doing. And we're going to do it right here. And so I was impressed with something. I knew I had been, re it had been revealed to me that the devil's plot is to just flood the church with millions of half-converted people. That's what happened to Thyatira. That's what happened with the Roman Catholic priest. They let down the standards to bring millions into the church, and it corrupted the whole thing. And I knew that the devil was trying to do the same thing today. Do you believe it? Yes. That's one of his big things. Bring in millions of people that are half converted. They will drag everybody else down. Uh, what will they do? Will they uh, help lead to the celebration movement? Yes. Will they lead to all kinds of corruption in Babylon? Yes. And if people are worried and concerned about what they're seeing in the church, well, this is a simple reason why. Because so many millions have come in half converted that they've been dragging it down just like the devil planned. But keep in mind, God is allowing it. Why is God allowing it? Because we are in what kind of time? We're in the shaking time where, where God is going to, within the church, separate the, uh, uh, you know what I mean, shaking. People are moving this way like this. Uh, God's prophet says there will be two groups revealed within God's church. One group are like those cult people that are all tied together with the same knot. The other group are, are another kind of people that, that uh, don't fill their mind with the word of God, but go by other things. And so we see what's happening. But uh, within all of this, God is in control. Thank the Lord for that. And so this is what's happening. And we understand it. But Jesus, the good news is Jesus will come again to his temple and do what? 
cleanse it. That's his 9T228. Look that up. That's a powerful statement. 9T228. Jesus will come again to his temple today in our day and cleanse it like he did the beginning and end of his ministry on the earth. When he did it in his, on the, when he was here, and you can read about that in the Zara of Ages in the chapter called In His Temple. Another chapter called The Temple Cleansed Again. Those two chapters tell how Jesus is going to do it in our day, in his church, when he comes in with a whip. What will the whip be made out of in our day? Because he's not going to, we're not going to see him personally, but he's still going to come with a whip, and how's he going to do it? That's correct. The devil's law, the National Sunday law, will be his whip. Just like in the Bible, he says that the Assyrians were his rod in his hand in Old Testament time. God used the Assyrians to pound on his own people and had something. And he used the Babylonians and the Philistines and, and the Midianites. God uses the heathen to help his people. Isn't that amazing? They help us. And so the Babylonians, spiritual Babylon, are going to help us in the near future by passing this law. Well, here we're going to talk more you know, about Sardis. There was a big, the bottom line problem with the people of Sardis was they lacked the same thing that those in Laodicea lacked, and Thyatira, and all the other ones. And what was that? Jesus. There's one thing. There's one door into heaven, and that's Jesus. There's one roadway leading to heaven, and it's narrow, but that road is Jesus. He said, I am the road, or I am the way, the roadway. And we walk in the middle of that road. Most people fall into one of two ditches, but don't do it. Stay right in the middle of Jesus, and on the road in the Bible will help you do that. And so the people in Sardis... Their main problem, he said, you have a name uh, that you live, but you're dead. Why, how can you be dead? Unless you lack Jesus. That's the key. That's the answer. And that's where these handouts come in that I just gave to you. Because on this handout, it gives the seven statements of Jesus on the cross. How many of you knew that Jesus made seven statements when he was on the cross? How many of you knew that? Let me see your hand. One, two. All right. I have to admit to you that I didn't know that myself until this past week. I just learned it this past week. And when I learned that, it was very thrilling to me. It makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense that Jesus on the cross would say seven things. And that, not only that, when I found out that he said seven things on the cross, that put tremendous emphasis on what he said. It showed tremendous meaning and, sim and uh, uh, symbolism, and especially meaning, to whatever he said. And it caused me to analyze those seven statements, because every single one of them would have tremendous meaning. And so let's look at them in this handout that I gave you. Number one is Luke 23, 34. The first thing he said. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the first thing he said when he was on the cross. And it's interesting. He was on the cross, but the cross was in what position? When he said this, he was on the cross, but the cross was lying on the ground. And he had stretched his arms out and lying on the ground, and they were pounding the spikes through his hands and feet while he was laying on top of the cross, and while they were doing that work, he was praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You can read about that in Desire of Ages 744, that find out he was down on the ground when he prayed this prayer, but he was truly on the cross, even in that position. Here, um, I'm not going to read all this, but I'm just going to comment on here. Um, here it says... The, uh, it says, Father, forgive them. Jesus refers to both the Romans and the Jews who had been instrumental in condemning and crucifying him. His prayer would not in itself, however, remove their guilt. But in a broader sense, this prayer includes all sinners to the end of time, for all are guilty of the blood of Jesus. When Jesus was praying this prayer, Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do. He was praying for you, friend. Isn't that wonderful? He was praying for you. I want to accept that prayer of Jesus for me, don't you? We can accept that prayer. Every prayer of Jesus has been answered, every single one. This prayer is going to be answered too. And you'll be part of it if you simply receive it in simple faith. Forgiveness. So, uh, beside that verse, now, my copy does not have it, but your copy does. Uh, beside the verse, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It says this is a statement of what? Forgiveness. forgiveness. Mine doesn't say that, but yours does. This is his statement, uh, our prayer of forgiveness. It takes in every one of us. Aren't you glad that he said that? That was the very first thing he ever said, for our forgiveness. And we can receive that to your own self. It's yours. It's yours. It's a gift from Jesus, right there from the cross. Forgiveness to you. Praise God. Here it says, The Savior made no murmur of complaint. His face remained calm and serene, but great drops of sweat stood upon his brow. He wasn't just hanging there with a, you know, thinking about nothing. He had the sins of the whole world upon him. His father had been withdrawing from him. He was a horrible, guilty uh, sinner, uh, a snake on the pole. And uh, no wonder the blood came right out of the pores of his skin. Have you ever suffered from your own guilt? Guilt drives people absolutely crazy. They bang their heads against the wall. They go insane. They go into mental institution. They go totally crazy because of guilt. The brain cannot take it, and, it, and it, uh, it's destroyed from guilt. Jesus had not only your guilt. He had everybody's guilt, billions and billions of people in the whole world upon him. No wonder blood came out of the pores of his skin as he was in the garden, and he was as he was on the cross. And he prayed. He wasn't praying for himself. He was praying for you. Isn't that wonderful when he said those words? Um, he says, while the soldiers were doing their fearful work, Jesus prayed for his enemies because he was dying for them also. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can you imagine the horrible mental suffering? You're going through such suffering as that, and you're not even thinking about yourself? You're only thinking of others and only praying for others. That's the way he was. It says his mind passed from his own suffering to the sin of his persecutors and the terrible retribution that would be theirs. No curses were called down upon the soldiers who were handling him so roughly. No vengeance was invoked upon the priests and rulers who were gloating over the accomplishment of their purpose. Christ pitied them in their ignorance and guilt. He breathed only a prayer, a plea, for their forgiveness, for they know not what they do. Had they known that they were putting to torture one who had come to save the sinful race from eternal ruin, they would have been seized with remorse and horror. But their ignorance did not remove their guilt, for it was their privilege to know and accept Jesus as their Savior. Some of them would yet see their sin and repent and be converted. Praise God for that. Some, by their penitence, would make it impossible for the prayer of Christ to be answered for them. That's what most Seventh-day Adventists are going to do in our day. By their persistence in sin, it will make it impossible for that prayer, for them to receive that prayer. But it says that prayer of Christ, uh, I'm sorry, it says Jesus, he, nevertheless, he was earning the right to become the advocate of man in the Father's presence. He says that prayer of Christ for his enemies embraced the world. Aren't you glad? It, he was praying for you. It took in every sinner that had lived or should live. From the beginning of the world to the end of time, upon all rests the guilt of crucifying the Son of God. I'm guilty of murdering Jesus, and so are you. And uh, doesn't it give you joy and peace? We don't have to live in guilt for a moment to know that I murdered Jesus because of his death. You and I are clean. His blood covers us. That's a mystery, isn't it? And we don't understand it. You murder Jesus and that very one that you murder saves you? That's a mystery. But here it says, Whosoever will may have peace with God and inherit eternal life. Praise God. Whoever will. And then the second statement of Jesus on the cross was when uh, the thief said to him, Remember the poor thief? This is in Luke 23, 43. It says, Verily, Jesus 
the, the thief looks at Jesus, and uh, I'm going to read. I'm going to read here a little bit before I read that verse. And uh, it goes on here, talking about paradise. This is interesting. It gives the Greek word for paradise. And uh, let me go ahead. I'll read the verse for us. It says, Verily I say unto thee today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. I read it the way it should be. And then I give the Greek words for the word uh, uh, today and for the word paradise. And all of this sentence spells it out here in the original Greek on your handout, showing that the comma was put in the wrong place by these humans. They didn't realize this. And uh, uh, the context reveals that uh, it must be uh, saying, I say unto thee today, today I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. That's the way it must be. Why? Because Jesus did not go to paradise that day. Uh, he said to Mary, after his resurrection, he said, I am not yet ascended to my Father. Number two, the evidence shows that the thief himself did not <coughs> die that day. Uh, because uh, uh, hanging on the cross, the death was a very lingering process. It took three or four days for a person to die hanging up there, many times. And it was hard to even tell when the person was dead. Uh, it was hard to tell. And so they wanted, the priests wanted them taken down over the Sabbath, so they broke their legs so they wouldn't run away. Elder H.M.S. Richards said that they had to, these two thieves had their legs broken. Can you imagine how it feels, a great big sledgehammer, bang, and break your leg? How would that feel? And then they cut you down and you fall down on the ground with your broken legs, and then they drag you or carry you and throw you in a cell, and then you're there in the cell laying on the floor with your legs broken, and you can't get up and run away. You're in terrible pain and suffering. But one of those thieves had peace with God. Praise God. He had peace with God. He could lay there in that terrible physical suffering with his legs broken and hungry and thirsty. He could lay there all through the Sabbath and then be hung back up on the cross on Sunday. But joy and peace in his heart, knowing I have eternal life. I have eternal life. I tell you, isn't that wonderful? It's wonderful. Uh, so the evidence shows the thief did not die that day. Jesus himself said that he didn't go to heaven that day. That's why we know where the comma should be in that verse. Uh, and of course, when the Bible was originally written, there were no commas, there were no periods. So nobody changed the Bible. They just added commas and periods later, hundreds of years later, and it's no big deal, no problem, because from the context, we can see where the comma should be. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the Bible at all. It is the Word of God. Thank the Lord for that. Now let's go on here. Uh, here on page 2, here it says, To Jesus in his agony on the cross, there came one gleam of comfort. You think that thief had agony. Jesus had agony. Because did you know that the agony, mental agony of Jesus was so great, the prophet says his physical pain was hardly felt. Jesus didn't even hardly feel it. He didn't hardly feel those terrible crown of thorns on his head, which would stick you terribly and be horrible torture. He hardly even felt it. He didn't even hardly feel those great spikes through his hands and through your tender feet. What would it feel like to spikes be driven through your feet, both feet, both hands? He hardly felt it. He hardly felt anything here. He hardly felt the terrible whipping twice for uh, 39 lashes and his back like raw meat. He hardly felt it all. He hardly felt hanging there all the weight of his body dragging on his shoulders and they're pulled out of their sockets. He hardly felt the terrible pain on his feet with his spikes and the weight of his body on his feet. He hardly felt it all. Why? Because of our sins, his mental agony was so great that gives you a little glimpse out of all that physical suffering what the mental agony was because, friend, of your sins and my sins. His mental agony was so great because his father had left. And he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's all he was thinking about. That love relationship was so close 
forever and ever in the past that breaking that up and leaving him, he hardly felt anything else and our sins. Another thing that killed him was the knowledge that the entire world could be saved, but most of them wouldn't. That was the second thing that killed him and caused his heart to swell and get larger and larger until it exploded. He died of a broken heart. Uh, his mental agony was so great. Isn't that amazing? But it says to Jesus in his agony on the cross, there came one gleam of comfort. Just one. Even his disciples left him. Their faith was totally dead. It says it was the prayer of the penitent thief. Both the men who were crucified with Jesus had at first railed on him, and one under his suffering had become more desperate and defiant, but not so with his companion. His companion had been tricked into sin and led more and more. This man was not a hardened criminal. Many people get into sin that way, and then their reputation is ruined forever. But many times they're more righteous than the church people that kicked them out. That's the way it was here. It says, this man was not a hardened criminal. He had been led astray by evil associations, but he was less guilty than many of those who stood beside the cross. And the prophet was very kind because she didn't tell who they were, but you know who they were, don't you? They were church members and they were uh, Adventist ministers standing down there. It says, uh, uh, reviling the Savior, he had seen and heard Jesus and had been convicted by his teaching, but he had been turned away from him by guess who? by the priests and rulers, seeking to stifle conviction. He had plunged deeper and deeper into sin until he was arrested, tried as a criminal, and condemned to die on the cross. In the judgment hall and on the way to Calvary, he had been in the company with Jesus. He had heard Pilate declare, I find no fault in this man. He had marked his godlike bearing and his pitying forgiveness of his tormentors. On the cross, he sees the many great religionists shoot out their tongue. They stuck their tongue out at him with the scorn and ridicule the Lord Jesus. He sees the wagging heads. He see, hears the uplifting speeches taken up by his companion over there. Uh, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. The conviction comes back to him that this is the Christ. Turning to his fellow criminal, he says, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? The dying thieves have no more to fear from man, but upon one of them presses the conviction that there is a God to fear and a future to cause him to tremble. And now, all sin polluted as it is, his life history is about to close. And we indeed justly, he moans, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. The Holy Spirit now is illuminating his mind. In Jesus, bruised, mocked, and hanging on the cross, he sees the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And now, a dying soul casts himself upon a dying Savior. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Quickly, the answer comes back. Full of power and hope. The words, Verily I say unto thee today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. Can you imagine how that man feels? Peace with God floods his soul. He's hanging there. He's going to suffer terribly, but he doesn't really care all that much anymore because... I have peace with God. My sins are gone. I have eternal life. I'm going to be with Jesus. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You could endure death if you knew that, couldn't you? Do you know that? The answer is yes. If you're receiving that prayer of Jesus we just read, Father, forgive me. If you receive it right now to free gift, I'm telling you, you know that right now. You have eternal life right now. Your sins are gone right now. And you're not hanging on the cross. You're not being tortured to death. But Jesus is telling you, He is your Savior right now. How does that make you feel? Isn't that wonderful? Praise God.
I want to ask you, I want to ask everybody sitting here, if you're, by the grace of God, if you're serious, and you're serious about claiming this gift of Jesus when He prayed for you on the cross, this forgiveness that's free right now, and Jesus is your Savior right now, and this promise to the thief that He gives to us to be with Him in paradise, how many of you are willing, by the grace of God, to totally surrender your will, your life, everything you are and have to Jesus to receive this gift, to receive this forgiveness and this peace with God. Would you lift your hand right now? Praise God. Praise God. It's worth it, isn't it? It's worth it to have Jesus uh, no matter what we go through. Praise the Lord. And by the way, this second statement of Jesus, I say to thee today, there shall be with me in paradise. Beside it, it says it's a statement of what? What does it say on your paper? It's a what? A promise. A statement of promise. Promise. Eternal life. That promise is for you and me. Now we go to the third one. This third statement that Jesus said on the cross. John 19, 26. He says, Woman, behold thy son. And he looks at John. Behold thy mother. Beside your quote, it says it's a statement of what? Full provision. Full provision. That is for you too. Uh, like in the 23rd Psalm, it's full provision in the 23rd Psalm. Here are the seven statements of Christ on the cross. Give us full provision, spiritually, mentally, physically, forever. These seven statements cover every need we'll ever have. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. Study these seven statements of Christ on the cross. Behold thy mother. This is a physical promise for you that he will give you provision. Now, Jesus had brothers. Why didn't he have one of his brothers take care of their own mother? Why did he commit it to John instead of one of Mary's own sons? Because they were not believers in Christ. And John was. John was close to Jesus. Uh, Jesus knew he would take good care of his earthly mother. And so he committed him to a brother in Christ, brother to a physical blood brother. Isn't that amazing? But yet he provided for his own mother. That shows that we will provide for not only our parents, for our children, for anyone possible that is suffering and, uh, you know, uh, suffering in any way. Uh, I remember one time, and now does that even include animals? Uh, is the, does a man, does the Bible say a, a person has kind regard even for his beast? But it says the tender mercies of the wicked are what? Cruel. I remember one man had a whole bunch of cats. Have you ever had a whole bunch of cats? I remember one lady had 25, about 25 cats. How would you like 25 cats all in your house? Wouldn't that be nice? And they'd sleep you, with you in the bed, and they'd be up on the table and eat with you on the table, <laughs> and they would just be everywhere in the house with you at all times. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And you'd see these cats laying around, and they'd put you at ease because they're so relaxed all the time. And uh, so uh, this man had many cats, but you know, he wasn't feeding them right. He just wasn't feeding them. They were so skinny, and they were crying because they were hungry. And I know of a man who saw all those cats, and his heart was touched. And he went to the store, and he bought a bag of 25 pounds of cat food. And he went to this man's house, and he dumped that 25 pounds of cat food in a great big pile, right on the ground in this man's yard. And he put pails of water all around this cat food, lots of water in this big mountain of cat food, and he drove away, and nobody ever knew who did it. Uh, isn't that amazing that a man would do something like that? So even, you see, God provides not only for people, does God even provide for animals? Yes, he does. Now, the fourth one says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What does it say beside that one? It's a statement of what? What does it say? Sacrifice. It's a statement of sacrifice. Friend, when you go to the great judgment bar of God, do you need a sacrifice? If you don't have one, what's going to happen? Who's going to be the sacrifice? You are. You will die. 
and be burned up until not even one particle of your body is left. Absolutely gone, vaporized forever. You will be the sacrifice and sin. Now, it's not that God wants to do that to you. He didn't want to do that to you. God himself turned himself into a man that you don't have to suffer that. He suffered that even more uh, for everyone. You don't, he doesn't want you to suffer that. But if you refuse that sacrifice, you will be the sacrifice of your own self to get rid of sin so it doesn't corrupt and destroy others forever throughout the universe. But here, this is the great provision of sacrifice. He took it, that we go free and we live forever with him in heaven. Now to have a great sacrifice, you'd have to have somebody that could actually die for your sins and then raise their own self from the dead. Who can raise their own self from the dead after their death? Who could do that? Only God. And that's what God did. Isn't that wonderful? We have a wonderful God, don't we? Don't we need to keep praising Him? Praise Him constantly. God dwells in our praises. Finally, number five. It says, uh, John 19:28. Two words, I thirst. Why did Jesus say that on the cross? What good did that do anybody? Wasn't that selfish? Was that a selfish statement to say I thirst? Because he's talking about himself. He's talking about his own suffering. Was that a sin for him to say that? No. no. <laughs> Talk about suffering. Anybody suffering? Anyone has a right to say, I thirst, he had a right to say that. But he didn't say it for his own self, because he's going to be dead in just a few minutes. He didn't say it for himself. He said it for us. And beside that verse, what does it say on your paper? It's a statement of what? Identification. Identification with us. He said it to let us know that whenever you are suffering in any way, Jesus is identified with you. Remember his words as he hangs there with the weight of the guilt of the world on him. So great mental agony that the horrible pain of all of this, the horrible pain, is hardly felt. He said, there is no such suffering worse than that suffering. And remember, if you're suffering, Jesus' words when he said, I thirst. That will comfort you, won't it? Oh, yes. You'll know I'm not suffering anything compared to what Jesus is suffering. He identifies with him. Here it says, let him who is struggling against the power of appetite look to the Savior in the wilderness of temptation. See him in the agony upon the cross as he exclaims, I thirst. When you're, the devil is tempting you with appetite, something you put into your mouth, and you, say, you think, I just can't live without that anymore. I've got to have it. I'll suffer if I get rid of that. Remember when Jesus said, I thirst. What tremendous meaning, what tremendous suffering. He was, we're, 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 we suffered nothing. It's a shame for us to hold on to appetite. When Jesus said, I thirst, he has endured all that it is impossible, is possible for us to, to bear. His victory is ours. <laughs> Praise the Lord. His victory is yours. He overcame appetite. You, by the grace of God, will overcome appetite. Don't think that you can't, because if you take that position, you won't. And if you don't, what will happen? You will burn with your belly. Your belly and you will burn together along with your sin, with your appetite, burn together and the universe will be free from it. I pray that you will be free from it so that God won't have to get rid of you as well as appetite. And I pray that for myself also. All of us have this to wrestle and to pray, oh God, save me. These things I know are not good for my body. They're stimulants, and they make my blood feverish, and they make my brain so I can't be, you can't talk to me like I know, and I know the prophet revealed this to us. Please, Lord, help me not make excuses anymore. Give me victory. I claim this where you said I thirst. I claim your victory. Thank you, Lord, and God will help you. He will help you. Here it says, uh, the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. Behold, the Lord God will help. Praise the Lord. Number six, he said, it is finished. Tremendous words. Those words were very meaningful. 
uh, beside that verse, what does it say on your paper? It's a statement of what? Do you like that? <laughs> In those words, he was addressing the Father. And when he cried out, it is finished in a tremendous voice that went almost seemed like it went around, echoed around the world. Tremendous power. Now that shocked the Romans because a man dying on the cross, it, he's so weak that he can't hardly talk. And here this tremendous voice comes out of this dying man. It is finished, it seemed to resound around the world. Supernatural voice. He was addressing the Father in that voice. Here it says, Before the foundation of the earth were laid, the Father and the Son had united in a covenant to redeem man if he should be overcome by Satan. They had clasped their hands, they held hands. Can you imagine that? The Father and Jesus held hands. And they pledged that Christ would become surety for the race. This pledge Christ has now fulfilled. He's done it. When upon the cross he cried out, It is finished. He addressed the Father. The compact had been fully carried out. Had Jesus failed? Had he failed? Praise God. His own right hand had gotten him to victory. He had not failed. And because he didn't fail, you have hope. I have hope. Isn't that wonderful? You and I cannot be saved by works. Was Jesus saved by works? His own right arm, it says, had gotten him the victory. Although, yes, he replied upon his Father for strength, but he didn't need grace and forgiveness like we do. His own right arm had gotten him the victory. In that sense, he was saved by his own right arm, if you know what I mean. Thank God. Uh, thank God for that. Here it says Satan had been unmasked, uh, and Satan could not cause Jesus to fall, to, to lose. Uh, and then he... He, he had finished this compact, and before his father he said, I will that they also, he points at us. Here they are, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. You can be there by the throne of God, because Jesus didn't fail. Praise the Lord. It says, now the voice of God is heard proclaiming that justice is satisfied. Satan is vanquished. Christ's toiling, struggling ones are accepted in the beloved. Praise God. And finally the Father says, let all the angels of God worship him. Is Jesus worthy to be worshipped? Oh, yes. Is he worthy to have you fall down on your face in front of him and worship him? Yes, he's worthy, friend. Praise God. God, the Father says, let all the angels of God worship him. Hundreds of millions fall on their faces. And they worship him. Thank God for that. You're going to see him soon yourself. You will fall on your face and worship him too. Thank the Lord. Here it says, Well then might the angels rejoice as they looked at the Savior's cross because even though they didn't understand everything, they knew that the destruction of sin and Satan was, was forever made certain and that the redemption of man was assured. And they knew that the universe was made eternally secure. Christ himself fully, notice the word, fully understood and comprehended the results of the sacrifice on Calvary. And to all these, Jesus looked forward when he cried out, It is finished. He understood it all. Praise God. Number 7, Luke 23, 43, 46. Father, into thy hands I commit, commend my spirit. He said this, he is a victor, and he bowed his head, and he died. And I thank God that he did it for you, friend. It says, by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Praise God, friend. Until we're with you next time, remember, friend, it's true. The lovely Jesus loves you.